Thanks very much for the invitation to be here, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, I just heard that uh, two people drove all the way from Nottingham to hear me speak, so I, I feel under terrible pressure not to be really boring now. Um, so I'm going to talk largely about one particular group of pesticides and their potential impact on bees. Um, neonicotinoids, I'll explain what they are shortly. Um, and there is this sort of huge controversy at the moment um, as to whether they're safe or not. Uh, they were, until very recently in Europe, the most widely used insecticides. But they were banned in December 2013, or rather I should say there's a, a moratorium began in December 2013 um, for two years. And it's not a complete ban, it's, it's, it means that certain uses are prohibited um, for at least two years, um, particularly their use on flowering crops that bees might feed on, so in this country mainly oilseed rape. Um, and they can't be applied to seeds that are sown in the summer uh, when bees are active. But they can still be used on, for example, winter wheat, and they still are being widely used uh, in horticultural crops and in other ways that I'll talk about. Um, the big question is, what should happen next? Is It's only a temporary moratorium. Um, Will it be extended uh, or will it be allowed to lapse? And the UK government um, has argued very strongly against the moratorium. They voted against this this, the, the moratorium in the European Parliament. Uh, they've publicly said that they don't think there's any risk to bees at all. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is kind of outline the, um, the evidence as I see it. And I, I'd love to be able to say to you as a scientist that I am completely objective and impartial in this. I think you'll pretty quickly see that I'm, I might have just ever so slightly lost that impartiality, but I, I'll, I'll endeavour to present the facts as they are. But first, let me just say a little bit about, uh, about bees. Um, so I work mainly on bumblebees, um, but it's important to stress that there are lots of species of bee. Uh, many people think there's one species of bee, the bee, and it lives in a box and it makes honey and it pollinates everything. Um, if you ask them to draw a bee, they'll draw something that's round and fat with yellow and black stripes, which actually isn't the thing that lives in a box. The thing that lives in a box, of course, is the honeybee there on the left, which actually is a slightly drab-looking insect. Uh, the cartoon bee, the thing that a child would draw if you asked them to draw, draw a bee, is actually a bumblebee. They're the bigger, furrier, stripier, um, wild bees, cousins of, of honeybees. But it's important to remember that actually that is just the, the sort of tip of the iceberg of bee diversity. There are loads of other species of bee. Um, in the world, something like 20,000 species of bee, only 250 of which are bumblebees and all the rest. Are, there's a whole amazing diversity of weird and wonderful, interesting species, about uh, 225 of them in the UK alone. Um, much of which, they're little studied, we don't know much about them, and they're generally ignored, and I, so I feel a little bit guilty that I'm not going to mention them again. But they're there, and you should remember. Um, okay, so I focus on bumblebees. My justification in, for focusing on bumblebees uh, when I'm writing grant applications and so on is that they're enormously important, both economically and ecologically. Um, so... Um, Honeybees don't pollinate everything, of course. Um, different bees, different insects uh, are good at pollinating different things. And bumblebees have certain crops that they're very good at. So, for example, tomatoes, because they need buzz pollinating, um, are almost all commercially pollinated by uh, bumblebees. Uh, and so pretty much every tomato you've eaten since 1988 was pollinated by a bumblebee. I'll, I'll explain the 1988 a bit later. Um, but they're also very good at raspberries and strawberries and runner beans and, and various other things. Um, uh, and they're also very, very important pollinators of wildflowers. So literally in, in Europe, there are thousands of species of wildflowers that are pollinated primarily by bumblebees, some by just one or two species of bumblebee. Um, and so if we were to lose our bumblebees, then there would be huge repercussions for us and for, uh, for wildflowers and, and generally for wild ecosystems. And hence, we should be concerned that they're not doing so great. Um, so in the UK, we, we have 25 species. Three have gone extinct. Um, and some of the others are, are pretty close to going extinct. 
Um, and similar, it's not just Britain where they're suffering. Similar things have happened elsewhere in the world. So in, four species have gone extinct throughout the whole of Europe. North America has seen some really dramatic declines since the 90s of, of species which were once very common. So things like um, Bombus terricola, was, if, if you're a, a familiar with bumblebees, it was kind of the equivalent of Bombus terrestris, the buff-tailed bumblebee in North America. It was the commonest bee and it's disappeared from almost the entire continent in the last 15 years, um, which is pretty concerning. Um, there are also things happening in South America um, where native bees are disappearing, very, native bumblebees are disappearing, but that's probably more to do with diseases that have been accidentally transported there from Europe, which I'll also touch on again briefly later. But broadly, the world picture for bumblebees is looking a little bit bleak right now. So let me just show you one rather depressing example. Um, so this is a lovely bee, the great yellow bumblebee, Bombus distinguendus. Um, in the first half of the 20th century, it was found all over Britain. Um, it was always a bit more common in the north, um, but it was found down here and in Kent and so on. By the second half of the 20th century, most of the populations in England and Wales had gone, and that's its distribution today. It's found only in the very far north and west of Scotland. So that's one of the species that I mentioned as being kind of critically endangered in Britain. Um, how long those populations will cling on is anyone's guess. So why have bees declined? Um, there are a number of reasons, and although my talk is going to focus mainly on pesticides, it's important to remember that, that and I'll say this several times because it really is important, that I, neither I nor any other sane person is arguing that bee declines are all to do with pesticides. Um, the, the biggest driver of bee declines has been loss of the, the flower-rich habitats that they used to live in. So, it's actually, it's a bit of a rubbish picture, but top right is a, is a, a picture of uh, the maca, which is a, one of the surviving fragments of flower-rich grassland in Britain. That's actually on South Uist, where those great yellow bumblebees live. Uh, and it's a sea of flowers, doesn't show up very well in the picture, but you might just be able to make out the mauve colour of lots of red clover, and there's lots of other stuff there as well. Um, we used to have about 7 million hectares of flower-rich grasslands in Britain uh, 100 years ago. And we, we did away with about 98% of them during the 20th century. Uh, and no flowers means no bees, largely. Uh, so we turned them into cereal fields, arable fields, or into silage fields, improved grasslands, uh, both of which are habitats which essentially have virtually no flowers in them. Um, and I'll show you some examples in just a second. The, the other reasons, which I'll briefly come back to um, for bee declines, um, are, relate to parasites and then the pesticides, which is what I'm going to focus on primarily. But first of all, I, I couldn't resist this. It's, uh, let me just take you on a, a world tour of agriculture. It's pretty obvious. I don't really need to speak to explain why bees have declined. So we'll go to Cambridge here first. There you go. Street view is a wonderful thing. You can drop down anywhere in the world and have a look. Um, so this is a random road in the middle of Cambridge here. It doesn't look so good for bees, does it? Um, if we go to northern France in the springtime, lovely countryside, look at that, beautiful. Um, not a flower in sight. Um, let's go to, I think, Belgium is next. There are a few, actually, a few flowers there, good old Belgium. Uh, the Netherlands looks pretty rubbish. Sweden, S skip across to North America, that's Idaho. And we could just go on and on, but we won't because it gets boring. You get the idea, you can go to South Africa, Brazil, it all looks the bloody same. Um, Anyway, that's, that's basically why there aren't as many bees as there used to be. But then there's these other reasons. Um, I'm, I, I mentioned disease, and I'll just say a tiny bit more about that before I get on to the pesticide business. So bees naturally have lots of diseases, um, uh, of course, as do pretty much every, anything you might care to think of. Um, but we've exacerbated their problems by moving diseases around the world. So we started moving honeybees around the world hundreds of years ago. Um, the honeybee is native to, to Europe, and uh, we've taken them to the Americas. They didn't have any honeybees in the Americas until we took them there. We've taken them to Australia and so on, all over the place. They're in every country apart from Antarctica now. Um, and obviously 200 years ago when we started, or it's actually longer than that, but 200 years ago we had no idea about bee diseases, so we didn't, they didn't check the health of the hives before we moved them. And so we took bee diseases around the world with honeybees. 
And many of them aren't honeybee diseases, they're bee diseases, so they jump out into the wild bees and infect them and, and expose them to diseases that they don't have any resistance to. And then more recently, in the late 80s, um, a commercial trade in bumblebees sprang up because they're so good at tomato pollination. A guy in, uh, in Holland worked out how to breed bumblebees and he started selling them to, to people who had glass houses full of tomatoes. And up until that time, tomatoes were pollinated by employing guys to wander around with vibrating wands and buzz all the flowers in the glass houses, which you can imagine on a commercial scale would be a really rubbish job. And the, the, the labor bills must have been considerable. Bees are much cheaper. And so now every tomato glass house in the world, a uh, commercial one, uses bumblebees to pollinate their tomatoes, and there's also aubergines and chili peppers and so on. Um, but in exactly the same way as we did with the honeybees, even though this was much more recently, unfortunately, no one really twigged that these bumblebee nests to start with were all full of diseases, and we've shipped a whole load of bumblebee diseases around the world as well now. And that's what's causing the problems in South America. We've released European bee diseases, which are now sweeping across South America, wiping out the native uh, bumblebees which have no resistance to them, just as when, what happened when the first human, uh, humans, when the first Europeans went to the Americas 500 years ago. It's all just being reenacted in the bees now. A bit depressing. Anyway, let's move on to my main topic, which is pesticides. So, apologies for putting up a, a rather crowded slide. We're doing various studies at Sussex on, on the impact of pesticides on on bees, on, particularly on bumblebees, and we work on various local farms near the university, and one of the first things we did was we asked the farmers to tell us what pesticides they were applying to each field um, in, on their farm. And this is just one, this is, shows you one field, it's an oilseed rape field in, that was sown in 2012 before this moratorium. And it's just a list with the dates are along the left of, of the pesticides and other agrochemicals applied to that one field in one growing season from when the crop was sown to when it was harvested the following summer. Um, and as you can see, it's quite a long list. There are a couple of fertilizers in there, but they're mostly pesticides. We've got insecticides, we've got fungicides, we've got herbicides, we've got molluscicides, uh, about 20 different pesticides and a couple of fertilizers. From, from a bee's eye perspective, the ones that are most significant I've flagged up. Um, so at the top there in orange, there's the, the, the dressing on the seeds um, included one of these neonicotinoids I'll tell you about in a second called thiamethoxin there. Um, but that wasn't the only insecticide applied to the crop. Um, in November, it was sprayed with um, a pyrethroid, beta cyfluthrin. And then the next spring, it was sprayed several more times with other pyrethroids. And then the ones in, in blue are fungicides, which aren't themselves directly toxic to bees. But we know that they knock out the detoxification mechanism of bees. So if a bee is simultaneously exposed to either a neonicotinoid or a pyrethroid, the insecticide is, is much more toxic, up to a thousand times more toxic in the presence of the fungicide. So if you're a bee visiting this field of oilseed rape, you're going to be exposed to, to a whole slew, uh, a cocktail of different toxins that, that may or may not affect you. Um, I'll say it's kind of funny to see the names. See the third column there, the, 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 the kind of cute names that the pesticide companies give to their products. Um, it's, it reads a bit like, if you remember the, 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 the TV show Gladiators from the 1980s, 90s, whenever it was. Somewhat, there was one called Shadow, I remember. But then this poor old Gandalf has snuck into that list as well. He's now suddenly become an insecticide, which is kind of depressing. Anyway, so what are these neonicotinoids? Um, there are five different compounds that fall within this class of insecticide, named up there on the left. Um, and I've just shown you the, the areas of crop that they were used on in 2010 before the moratorium uh, in the, those figures there in the middle. Most of them, the first three on that list, are all used as seed dressings, and that's really their only use. Um, so top right is a picture of oilseed rape seeds that have been covered um, in a, a coating of a neonicotinoid, um, along with a dye, so the farmer knows they've been treated. And the idea is that you sow them in the ground, 
uh, and the, the farmer buys the, the seed pre-treated. He doesn't have to do anything at all. He just sows it just as he normally would, and they're water-soluble. They dissolve into the, to the soil water around the seed, and then as the seedling germinates and grows, it sucks up the pesticide, and they're systemic, so they go to all parts of the crop, and they protect all of the crop against any kind of insect that might eat it, that be eating the roots or the leaves or whatever. So it's brilliant, just what the farmer wants. Um, and it, and it doesn't, he doesn't need to do anything. It's all kind of pre-done for him. Uh, so uh, before the moratorium, they, were, they became pretty standard on most arable crops, most cereal crops, oilseed rape and so on, were all treated. Um, they're also, the, the, the bottom two in that list are mainly sprayed onto fruit crops and horticultural crops. So they use loads on apples and raspberries and strawberries and so on. Um, you can also buy these things for garden use. So that bottle over there, Ultimate Bug Killer, you can buy off the shelf. Anyone can buy, you don't need any training. You can buy them and uh, spray them onto uh, the flowers on the bottle they show that you might like to spray them onto. More of that in a second. They're also the main ingredient of most anti-flea treatments that you might put on your dog or cat. So if you've got a dog or cat, you've probably dripped stuff onto the back of its neck and rubbed it in you're actually giving it a huge dose of imidacloprid, the top left one there. Um, and we'll come to LD50s in a minute, but the dose recommended for a medium-sized dog, no one's, there isn't a known LD50 for dogs because no one's done a toxicity test with dogs, but it's, the, it's the enough to kill eight grey partridges and you put it on your dog every month. Um, anyway, just thought I'd mention that. Um, okay. I, have to, I, I, I can't resist sharing this slide. I don't know whether it makes me laugh or cry, but this was a special promotion uh, from Bayer, one of the manufacturers of these compounds, last year. Um, free seeds for bees. I, I, I don't know whether the idea is that you grow these lovely flowers and attract the bees in and then kill them really efficiently. Um, seems kind of ironic, but at least they have a Who ever said the Germans didn't have a sense of humor? Um, sorry, that was, I shouldn't have said that. Um, moving on. Um, so these compounds were introduced in the mid-90s. Uh, they were invented in the late 80s and came onto the market in 1994. And the, this just shows you the amount applied in the UK up to 2011. So you can see how they really took off. They were very successful. Um, and you can also make out that the, the compounds used have changed slightly because the the first one that came to market was imidacloprid, the one that's still used on dogs and cats. But then it's been largely replaced in recent years by um, thiamethoxam and clothianidin. But they're all very similar, those, those three compounds chemically. They do the same kind of thing. So, oh, sorry. So we're currently, the, just before the moratorium, we're applying 80 metric tons, 80,000 kilos to the UK, which actually isn't that much in pesticide terms. But then they are very toxic. So you normally measure toxicity of, of anything that you're worried about poisoning things with in terms of an LD50, the lethal dose that kills 50% of animals in a test. Um, and so that just shows you some LD50s for some different insecticides, some of which you might have heard of, particularly DDT. Um, so imidacloprid is the neonicotinoid at the top there takes four nanograms to give an LD50 to a, a honeybee, uh, and DDTs take 27,000 nanograms. So, so DDT is about 6,000 times less toxic to a honeybee than a neonicotinoid. So you don't need to use so much. That's why uh, 80,000 80, kilos doesn't sound that much, perhaps. Um, four nanograms is quite hard to visualize, but let me put it another way. If, I, if you had a teaspoon of imidacloprid, which would be f is five grams, then that's therefore enough to deliver an LD50 to one and a quarter billion honeybees. So it's quite a lot um, if they were to consume it, but that's the key thing. How much do they actually come into contact with? Because obviously it doesn't matter that it's really toxic to them if they don't eat the stuff. So how might bees be exposed to these chemicals? Well, um, the obvious route that everyone's focused on is, is arable crops. I've said that they're, they, they're, they're routinely applied as seed dressings, they're systemic, they go throughout the plant, and we know full well that they go to the pollen and nectar of a flowering crop. Um, and then bees consume it, because of course bees visit oilseed rape, or sunflowers, or whatever else it might be that you've grown. So that's an obvious route of exposure, that, and that's what most of the research has been done on. 
But they are also, as I said, sprayed on horticultural crops, and there's been less work on that. But they are sprayed, for example, on raspberries just before they flower. Um, there's also good evidence that they're turning up in field margin flowers, and I'll explain why that should be later. Uh, and, of course, if you spray ultimate bug killer in your garden, they'll be in garden flowers. So there are various ways that bees could be exposed to them. The key thing is what kind of concentrations are they exposed to? Well, uh, those are the kinds of concentrations that bees might encounter. So there have been quite a few studies where people have taken pollen or nectar from uh, treated crops like oilseed rape and analyzed the concentrations of neonics in them. And typically, it, it's usually less than 10 parts per billion, often only one, two, three parts per billion in the pollen or nectar. So they're pretty dilute. Um, we're not talking about huge amounts, but they're very toxic. Um, the horticultural crops tend to have higher concentrations. The amounts in uh, garden flowers, no one's really looked at. Um, we've been studying the amounts in wildflowers. I've got loads of data on the amount found in wildflowers, and I'll tell you a tiny bit more about that later. But I'm not allowed to actually give you the figures because DEFRA funded the work, and they won't give us permission to make them public. Seems a little odd. Anyway, um, but those are the ways that bees might encounter these chemicals. The question is then, are, are those kind of concentrations enough to do them any harm? Now, I got interested in this um, about four or five years ago. And at the time, I was running the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, which is this charity devoted to saving bumblebees. And some of the members were, were emailing and demanding that we campaigned against these neonicotinoids, which were starting to attract a lot of attention. French beekeepers, in particular, were the first people to, to start complaining about these chemicals, saying that they were killing their bees when they put their hives near sunflowers in France. And that kind of raised the profile of this issue. And people started to campaign against them. But to start with, I was a bit skeptical, I must admit, because we also had emails saying that mobile phones were killing bees, uh, which I suppose might be true. But as far as I know, there's no evidence for that. Um, but anyway, I, I, eventually we got enough emails. I thought we should look into this. So we did a bit of digging, and, and there, was a, there were a reasonable number of papers that had been published, tended to be lab studies or, or studies with bees in flight cages, where they'd found that the kind of doses that you typically get in, say, oilseed rape, nectar, and pollen probably weren't enough to kill the bees. Um, but they seemed to mess up their behavior. They seemed to impair their ability to learn, to gather food, to navigate, and so on. But obviously, a bee doesn't need to do a lot of lab navigating in a lab. Um, or in a cage. Um, and things that impair their learning or their navigation are likely to have much more impact in the field when bees naturally um, perform really impressive feats of navigation. They, they can fly miles to find patches of flowers and learn to, to extract the rewards efficiently and bring the food back, and they do that all day long. So something that messed up their ability to do that could be really important in the real world, but wouldn't show up strongly in a lab test. So it seemed to me, and to some other groups at, a, at about the same time, that we tr needed to try to study this in the field. Um, so we, we set out to do that as best we could. Um, and so with, with my postdoc at the time, Penelope Whitehorn, who's up there top right, we designed quite a simple experiment. We, we got 75 bumblebee nests. Um, we exposed them to pesticides for two weeks. So we gave them food, pollen and nectar, which we'd added imidacloprid to at the dose that, they, that is found in the nectar of oilseed rape when it's been treated as a seed dressing. So 0.7 parts per billion in the nectar or six parts per billion in the pollen. So quite dilute again. We fed them that for two weeks. Or we, or we, 25 nests got that dose, 25 got control, healthy food, and 25 got double the dose. Um, and then after two weeks, we put the nests outside and we opened the doors, and the bees then had to feed themselves. They had to go out and forage. And we just left the nest to do what bumblebee nests do for the rest of the year. And we just weighed them and monitored how well they did. Um, and so this is what we found in terms of weight change. You can see the control nests grew, grew larger, and then they start to senesce as they produce queens at the end of the season. Um, if you look at the queen production, now. I haven't talked you through the annual life cycle of a bumblebee, but the nests all die off naturally at the end of the summer and produce queens and males, and it's only the mated queens that, that survive the winter. So queen production is kind of all important to the success 
of a bumblebee colony. And the queen production seemed to be particularly badly hit by exposure to the pesticide. So we actually found an 85% drop in queen production, even at the sort of field realistic low dose of the pesticide. Um, and at this point, I, I, I must admit, from being rather sceptical, I thought, OK, there really does seem to be something going on here. Now, that, that was published in 2012 and attracted quite a lot of attention um, and actually was one of the papers that triggered the EU to think about banning um, these pesticides. In immediate response to uh, the publication of this work, um, DEFRA um, asked... Ferrer, um, its research wing at the time, which has apparently just been privatised, which I find slightly bizarre, but anyway, um, uh, the Food and Environment Research Agency up in York, they asked them to repeat what we'd done, but with one improvement to the method. So our study was criticised um, on the grounds that the bees weren't free to choose where they foraged. They were forced to eat pesticide-treated food or healthy food. Um, and in the real world, obviously, bees might avoid a treated crop or whatever. Um, so it wasn't entirely natural. And that's an absolutely fair criticism. Um, what we did wasn't entirely um, uh, what happens in the real world. So what they did was they got bumblebee nests and they put them next to either treated or untreated crops. They found a field of oilseed rape that hadn't been treated, which at the time was really hard to find. They had to drive 100 miles to find it. Um, and they put, I think it was 20 nests next to an untreated field of oilseed rape, 20 next to one treated with um, clothianidin, and 20 next to one treated with imidacloprid. So the bees were then free to choose where they foraged. They didn't have to go on the field that they were next to. They could go off somewhere else if they wanted to, just like a wild bumblebee nest. Um, they took samples of the food stores from those nests, and they measured how much pesticides were in them. Uh, and unfortunately, all their controls were full of neonics. The bees obviously hadn't restricted themselves to the nice untreated field that they were next to, but had gone off across the landscape and fed on something. We don't know what. And actually, the, 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 um, their control nests, on average, had more pesticides in them than the ones next to the field treated with imidacloprid, which is pretty weird. Um, and, and at that point, you might have thought they might abandon and say, OK, um, we can't control the exposure of these bees. This experiment's been a bit of a disaster. We need to go back to the drawing board. But they didn't do that. Uh, they decided instead to publish this online with the conclusion that these pesticides have no effect on the development of bumblebee colonies, which is pretty astonishing for an experiment with no controls. Um, but Ian Boyd, who's DEFRA's chief scientist at the, uh, at the time, um, he used this study uh, as part of the evidence for the British government voting against the moratorium on these pesticides. He said, we've done our own work, and we found really no impact on bumblebees. But you didn't have any controls, mate. Um, anyway, actually, there's another way of looking at these data. If you look at each individual colony and you look at the relationship between how well that colony did and how much pesticide was in the nest... Um, then you actually find there is a significant negative relationship between queen production and the concentrations of each of the different pesticides that were present. It may not look like a terribly impressive relationship, um, but essentially the nests that had high levels of pesticide in them, none of them produced many queens. And statistically, um, sorry to bore you with a, a, a statistical output table, kind of pretty dull, but... Um, the significance of the impact of the different pesticide residues found in those bumblebee nests is shown on the right there. Most of them are having a reasonably strong negative effect on the number of queens produced and on the colony growth rate of those nests, which is the complete opposite of what Ferrer concluded um, from this same data. Uh, so just to annoy them, I've just reanalyzed their own data and got it published in a journal called Peer J, which is coming out next week, which they're going to love. Um, anyway, never mind. Um, I can't talk you through all the other studies that have been done on bumblebees and, pest and these pesticides. There have been loads in the last two or three years. Um, but every single study on bumblebees has concluded has found a negative impact of one sort or another at something approximating to field-realistic doses. 
Um, so, for example, um, people have found reduced pollen collections, the Gill et al. paper in Nature, so treated nests seem to be less good at bringing back food, which would explain why they grew less and produced fewer queens. Um, there have been studies that have shown uh, reduced egg laying by queens when they're exposed to really very low concentrations of pesticides. There have been studies that show increased susceptibility to parasites when exposed to neonicotinoids and so on. Um, it all kind of agrees and as someone who specialises in bumblebees it's really hard not to come to the conclusion that bumblebees in the real world are likely to be being negatively impacted by these pesticides. The story is much muddier for honeybees and that's where most of the attention has been. Um, and industry will point to three studies which um, have uh, field trials with free-flying honeybees which have found no effect of uh, exposing those colonies to a nearby field or a plot of treated crop. Um, now, I haven't got time to go into the details of those studies, and I, I could point out a number of sh shortcomings of them, but the principal one is that those three studies were all 100% funded by the pesticide industry itself, by the very companies that manufacture the pesticides that were being tested. And I really don't think any scientist can be truly independent if they're actually employed by Syngenta, either directly or indirectly, or by Bayer, um, one or the other in those two cases, three cases. Um, but I also think it's perhaps true that honeybees are better able to cope with these pesticides than things like bumblebees because they have enormous colonies with large numbers of workers and they may be able to cope with some of them getting lost, not bringing back food and so on, better than a much smaller colony like the colony of a bumblebee, possibly. Okay, so I just want to reiterate before I move on to some other stuff that um, I'm not trying to argue that these neonicotinoids are the only problem bees have. It should be obvious by now, but I really feel the need to say it again, because if you read the media, it will lead you to believe that if we ban... Some articles have basically said if we ban neonicotinoids, then bees will all be fine. Actually, there are many other stresses facing bees these days. I've already talked about the parasites, and there are other insecticides, which... Pyrethroids are clearly not good for bees. Any insecticide kills insects. Um, they've got this interaction with these fungicides I mentioned, which makes the, the insecticides more toxic. And you've got this background of basically a landscape that's almost devoid in flowers, all of which stress bees. And if a bee is hungry and infected with disease and is then gently poisoned with a cocktail of pesticides, it's hardly surprising if they're not doing so well. But it's that combination of factors that's really hitting them, I think, rather than any one of them. Okay. I'll skip that because I know I'm talking probably quite slowly. Um, so far, I've just talked about bees, but I think this is a much bigger issue than bees. So you might probably be aware that, that our wildlife generally isn't doing so well. Um, the RSPB produced their State of Nature report last year, and it was really depressing reading, an, an impressive document, but boy, there's a lot of things declining. The, the overwhelming majority of wildlife in, in, in Europe is declining, and probably in the world is declining. Um, biodiversity is basically in crisis. Species are going extinct at about a thousand times the background rate they did before we came along. Um, something is wrong. Um, so if you look in, in, in Britain, if you look at butterflies or moths or farmland birds, or even recently there was a study on caribou beetles, they're all declining. Um, there are exceptions. You can find species that are bucking the trend, but the majority of species, sadly, are declining. Now, you can understand why species declined in the 20th century, because for most of the 20th century, we were ripping out hedgerows, ploughing up flower-rich grasslands. We were destroying habitat to increase food production, and that was official policy. The government in the Second World War wanted us to be as self-sufficient as possible, so they encouraged farmers to increase field sizes, to drain marshes, to do everything they could to produce more food. And that had huge impacts on our wildlife, of course. But we stopped doing that towards the end of the 20th century. We started paying farmers to replant hedges, to put in wildflower strips. There's a whole swathe of agri-environment schemes that farmers can sign up to that are supposed to help um, increase biodiversity, and yet it's all still decreasing. Um, so it isn't working, as far as I can see. Um, 
Uh, we currently spend about 400 million a year on agri-environment schemes, which is quite a bit of taxpayers' money, uh, and seemingly with rather little effect. Now, I don't want to try and argue again that this is all due to neonicotinoids. It absolutely isn't. I think a lot of those agri-environment schemes just don't work and they're rubbish. But that's another story. Um, but I do think there's reason to believe that some of those declines, these broader declines beyond bees, might be driven by these pesticides. And I want to try and justify why I'm saying that. So um, let me just explain some of the, um, how these chemicals, what the, the environmental fate of these chemicals. So we start off with the dressed seed floating in the air there in the middle of that diagram. Um, that's those little blue oilseed rape seeds I showed you earlier, or wheat seeds or whatever. They're sown in the ground, they're water soluble, they're supposed to be absorbed by the crop when it grows. But actually, between, uh, only between 1 and 20%, depending on the crop, is actually taken up by the crop. The average is about 5%, so 95% of the seed dressing doesn't go where it's supposed to go. So, these chemicals were supposed to provide really good targeting, much better than spraying pesticides from a tractor, really good targeting of the crop. But actually, they don't, because most of the active ingredient does not go where it's wanted. It goes mostly into the soil. A little bit goes off as dust when the farmer is drilling the seed, and that's really toxic. And there's very good evidence that any flying insect around at the time will die within seconds if it's exposed to that dust. But that's only a very small amount of, of the active ingredient. About 94% of it is going into the soil and the soil water um, from where it can leach into the, the nearby ditch or stream or whatever, or be taken up by the roots of any other plant that has its roots in that soil. So it could be a, a flower strip sown by the farmer along the edge of the field or the hedgerow plants with their roots in that soil. What's more, these compounds are really persistent and have the potential to accumulate if they're used every year, which they have been until very recently. Um, so these data come from um, a Bayer study, their own study done in, in East Anglia, where they sowed uh, wheat seeds, uh, they sowed a wheat crop for six years in a row in the same fields. Uh, they had two different application rates and two different field sites, which is why there are four graphs in front of you. And the day before the next sowing date, they took soil samples and they analysed how much imidacloprid was in the soil. And as you can see, it increases over the six years. Um, I, I don't need to be a statistician, I don't think, uh, to see some kind of pattern there. But you can do the stats and there is a, a very strong uh, increase in concentration over time, which is exactly what we'd expect because there have been, been kind of lab studies of the half-life of these chemicals in soil, which suggest that they can, they can be up to a thousand days. So that means that, that a thousand days for three years. So that means after three years, half the chemical is broken down and half will still be there. And after six years, three quarters of it will have gone and a quarter will be left. So if you're adding them every year and they have a half-life of three years, you'd expect them to build up over time. Now, these studies were done by Bayer. They were submitted to the European regulators um, as in 2006 as part of a kind of regulatory package where they were checking on the safety of currently registered pesticides. And um, this, there's a document um, that's available to anyone to get off the internet. Um, and in the document, that's the wording that accompanies these data. Uh, the regulators concluded from these studies that this compound imidacloprid has no potential for accumulation in soil. When I, I, so it's kind of bizarre. I, I only found out about this because I was sent it anonymously by someone in the United States who'd found it somehow on, on the internet. It was on page 639 of an enormous document, so nobody would noticed it. Um, and I sent it on to the Environmental Audit Committee in, at Westminster, and they immediately phoned me up and said, you've sent us a fake document. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be arrested or something. Uh, but then they checked, and actually, no, it was the original document. And they, they just couldn't believe that the, the data and the words didn't seem to match, and they thought someone had fiddled with one or the other. But actually, no, this was the, that was what the regulators concluded. Um, now, whether that's um, incompetence or... Corruption is up to you to conclude, but you'd have to be pretty damned incompetent, wouldn't you, to, to conclude that from those data. Anyway, 
So they build up, or they can build up in soil, and they certainly last a long time in soil. They also last for ages in plants once they get into them. So it's common practice in North America to inject ornamental trees with neonicotinoids, um, particularly if they're ornamental trees in a car park where you might get honeydew on your paintwork of your fancy car if you park underneath, which would be an awful thing to happen, wouldn't it? Much better to inject the tree with an insecticide and, and make it toxic for four years, because that's roughly how long the tree becomes, uh, is protected against aphids and so on if you inject it, which is what this guy is doing. Um, those odd-looking trees over there are lime trees, because uh, they're, they're in Oregon, and a couple of years ago, an over-enthusiastic um, groundsperson decided to treat those trees with uh, a neonicotinoid just before they flowered. And as soon as they flowered, the next day there were 50,000 dead bumblebees lying on the tarmac underneath the trees. Apparently it looked like gravel. That's, you can't really see it, but that picture there is piles of dead bees amongst the blossom on the ground. Um, and those trees look odd because they've had to be bagged up. They've netted them in um, to stop any more bees killing themselves. And they're going to have to stay bagged up until at least 2017, when the chemical might have run out. Um, so if they get into woody plants, they stay there for ages and can do on, on, an awful lot of harm. They also, being water-soluble, we know they leach into streams. There have been a couple of really interesting studies from the Netherlands, which have found that, that in areas, in streams with higher levels of neonics, there are fewer insects. Well, amazing, isn't it? Um, who'd have thought it? But nonetheless, um, uh, important that someone's shown it. So, uh, and then more recently, there was a Nature paper last summer that came out which showed that insect-eating birds are declining more rapidly in parts of the Netherlands with higher concentrations of, um, of imidacloprid in the water, which have lower populations of insects, which again is hardly surprising. But Ian Boyd went on record the day after this was published saying that he thought it was, it was nonsense and th this was just correlation and not causation. So you've got an insecticide which kills insects and you're concluding that the fact that because there aren't any insects, the insect-eating birds aren't doing very well. Seems like quite a plausible link of causation to me, but nonetheless, uh, DEFRA's chief scientist said it was all nonsense. So you've got this nice pretty bit of English landscape um, and I fear that most of it is contaminated with insecticides, um, with these persistent neonicotinoids. We know, of course, the crop would have been treated until very recently. Um, there was a paper published last year which had looked at, uh, taken soil samples from British fields and found that almost all of them contained three different neonicotinoids, uh, usually including imidacloprid, even though farmers had stopped using them three years earlier, um, which is exactly what you'd expect because it's persistent. The work I mentioned that I can't tell you about has been sampling hedgerow leaves and soil from field margins and pollen and nectar from wildflowers uh, growing in field margins. And almost all of those come up positive for uh, a cocktail of neonic. So they're in the hedgerow shrubs. They're in flowering plants like hawthorns that bees visit early in the year. The bees aren't just exposed when they visit the flowering crop for a couple of weeks. They're exposed all year round because everything in the landscape is, in, is, is inundated, has absorbed these pesticides one way or another. Um, so it seems to me quite reasonable to conclude that this is probably having a broad impact on our wildlife. But you could say, well, tough, we just have to put up with this. This is necessary collateral damage because we need pesticides to, uh, to produce food. And obviously, we, d we do need to grow food to feed the seven billion people in the world. Um, and the, the agrochemical industry will tell you that farmers can't do without these pesticides. In the run-up to the vote in the European Parliament on this moratorium, um, the agrochemical industry produced a glossy document called the Anderson Report, where it said that, um, no, sorry, no, the Humboldt Forum's report at the top, where it said that if this moratorium was voted through, it would cost the European economy 17 billion in lost crop revenues and 50,000 jobs would be lost in the agricultural sector, which obviously in the middle of a, a Europe-wide recession sounds pretty bad and would frighten politicians into, it was intended to frighten politicians into voting against the moratorium. There have been similar reports more recently. What's the actual evidence to back up 
those claims? Well, actually, there really isn't any at all. Um, and what's really interesting is we've now, since the moratorium came in in December 2013, 2014, um, crops of sunflowers and maize were grown in Europe without neonics for the first time in, in a decade, and they actually got the highest yield for years uh, last year without using these seed dressings. Now, it's only one year, probably shouldn't get too excited, but it does seem to suggest that these claims that there would be massive crop yield losses uh, might actually be nonsense. In the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency recently announced, uh, produced a report in which it admitted, admitted that these, the use of neonics on, on soybeans was actually completely ineffective. There were no pests that attacked soybeans early in the crop cycle which would be protected um, by use of a neonic, and farmers were basically just being missold something that they didn't need. Uh, to the tune of $240 million a year, that was what farmers were paying for a seed dressing which is now acknowledged to be useless. So, am I saying that farmers are stupid? Um, I often hear people say, oh, come on, farmers aren't idiots, they wouldn't be using things that don't work. Well, you say that, but we all buy all sorts of shit that doesn't work all the time. Um, our entire economy is based on us buying stuff that doesn't work. Um, I, there's some silly examples there, but some le uh, apparently you really can buy armadillo repellent, but it doesn't work. Um, it's not such a big seller around here. Um, but there's some other examples there that you, I bet you most people here have, are familiar with some of those things and have spent good money on them and they don't work. Um, and there are lots of other examples you could think of. Essentially, farmers, I think, are being oversold or missold pesticides. I think they're being given poor advice. I think, well, it's certainly true that the majority of agronomists, 71% of British agronomists, uh, work for agrochemical companies, and agronomists are the people who advise farmers. Well, if their job is to sell pesticides, then of course they're going to advise the farmer to use more than he really needs to, which is probably why we end up with that long list of 22 different chemicals that I showed you earlier. In fact, it's really hard to find much evidence to support most of the recommendations that agronomists give to farmers. I'm sure they're not all ill-founded. Uh, I'm sure most agronomists do have a pretty good idea what they're talking about. Um, but nonetheless, if you actually try to find published studies which show, for example, how effective neonics are at increasing crop yield, or how effective any other current practices are, it's really hard to find them, which I find slightly kind of concerning, because basically we have to take it on trust that what farmers are currently doing is necessary to produce these, uh, to produce current yields. Um, there are alternative ways of controlling pests. You, you wouldn't think it from looking at modern farming practices, but back in the 80s, um, I was taught at university about integrated pest management, which was all the rage at the time, which is a whole philosophy based on using a whole range of techniques that are still available to farmers to minimize their pest problems and treating using an insecticide as the last resort rather than the first resort. Um, and the idea of prophylactically coating your crop seed with an insecticide before you even sow it would be complete anathema to the idea of IPM because the, with, under IPM you only use a pesticide when you have a pest problem. You would never use them prophylactically. And there are very good reasons for that, not least because just like with antibiotics, if you overuse something then uh, the target will become resistant. So we don't all take antibiotics routinely to prevent us getting ill, because if we did, antibiotics would stop working. And similarly, if you use pesticides prophylactically all the time, then they're not going to last long. Insects are going to become resistant to them very quickly. Okay. So after all I've said, you could argue that... Given that we have a human population of 7 million people that's going to grow to 9 or 10 billion people, did I say billion, million? Anyway, 7 billion. It's going to grow to 9 or 10 billion by the middle of the century. The, the FAO um, have um, said that we need to double food production by 2050. Um, perhaps the only way we can do that is through intensive farming through squeezing higher and higher yields out of the land. Um, do alternative forms of agriculture, are they really going to feed 10 billion people? Um, organic farming, for example, usually has yields are about 20% lower. Um, uh, 
many people will tell you that organic farming is just for rich folk, really. It's not going to feed poor people. I actually think what I've just, all of what I've just said is complete rubbish, but it's something that most people accept as read, that we need to increase food production. We need intensive farming if we're going to feed the world. If you argue against intensive farming, you're basically condemning poor people to starve. Well, that's complete nonsense. Poor people may be starving right now, but it's not because we don't have enough food. We currently waste about 40% of the food that we grow. It doesn't go to anybody at all. We actually grow enough food now in the world to feed the population we'll have in 2050 if we stopped wasting so bloody much of it. Um, and we actually currently have an epidemic around the world of obesity, um, of diabetes. That FAO calculation that we need to double food production is based on everyone in the world adopting a Western diet of eating loads of meat and sugar, which surely is not such a good idea. Can't we question that premise? Um, so actually, I think we don't need necessarily to go down this route. In fact, I think that's a really bad idea and provides the biggest chance that people really will be starving in a big way um, in 2050, and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, but to come back to the organic yield thing, yes, think more sustainable farming systems with reduced inputs probably on average produce lower yields. There's been very little investment, though, in those systems. So there's been tons of money poured into research, into intensive farming systems, into driving up yields. Um, and yes, they've, they've, that's been very successful. Yields from intensive farming increased greatly in the last 60 years. There's been almost no investment into more sustainable systems. Um, and I'm pretty sure if some money were put into that, then yields from those kind of organic systems and so on could be increased. It's DEFRA itself admitted recently in a, in a report that garden, a keen gardener or a, allotment owner can get between three and 11 times more food out of their land than an intensive arable farmer per hectare, which is pretty astonishing and suggests that actually perhaps we don't need to do more of this if we're going to feed the world in 2050. Relating to that, soil erosion it's calculated that we are currently losing about 100 billion tonnes of soil through soil erosion across the globe every year, which is about 15 tonnes per person on the planet, lost every single year, largely because of intensive farming. Um, so actually, if we carry on down this route, there's a real possibility that, yes, we will all be starving in 2050, but it'll be because there's no bloody soil left, and it'll be entirely because of this. So uh, I think we re should really question whether this is the way forward. Um, I was going to end on, on that point, but there's one extra thing I just wanted to throw in. So last night, I was looking at... There's a, uh, a website that you can look at called... Um, uh, farm subs farm farmingsubsidy.org or farmsubsidy.org, which lists the subsidies received by every farmer in Europe for the last 15 or so years, by name, every organisation that receives an agricultural subsidy. Kind of interesting, huge data set. Um, if you look at the UK, the biggest farm subsidy given to any one organisation um, went to Tate and Lyle, so Tate and Lyle received, since 1990, between 1999 and 2013, which is when the data goes up to, they received 600 million euros in British taxpayers' subsidy, presumably to grow sugar beet in East Anglia. I, don't, I haven't looked into it. I don't know why, what Tate and Lyle actually do, but that's my guess as to what they do. 600 million euros. So that's a, in, just under half a billion pounds over 12 or 13 years. What's 40 million a year of our money going? So what do we get for that? So you think about it. So, so I always thought farming subsidies supported kind of marginal farmers, small scale farmers who needed help to, to make a living. I didn't realise it was all going to massive corporations to make huge profits. Do we get an environmental benefit? Are sugar beet farms in East Anglia more environmentally friendly because of those subsidies? I don't think so. We saw a bit of Cambridgeshire earlier. Last time I went there, those sugar beet fields looked bloody awful. Are we supporting lots of farmers on the land, rural communities? I don't think so. These are huge fields that are probably farmed by two or three people on great big tractors. So we're not really, those subsidies aren't supporting rural communities. It's really hard to see what they are doing. Are they providing us with a, ensuring we have a cheap sugar supply? 
Uh, maybe they are, but do we really need a cheap sugar supplier? I don't think we do. So I think we should really question what the heck is going on. The current farming system seems to be set up so that basically we are subsidising huge corporations to ravage the land, which seems to me completely bonkers, and we should desperately try to do something about it. I really think there is a better way than this. There are actually lots of better ways, and we already know what they are, but it's really hard to see how we get to them. On that slightly depressing note, I, I will stop talking. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening. It's a good question. I'm afraid that's kind of beyond my area of expertise, flea control. Um, uh, yeah, anyone got any ideas? How do we control? There must be other ways of controlling fleas other than pouring neonics onto your dog or cat, I'd like to think. Uh, yeah, in, in short, particularly in the US, they've got big problems there where imidacloprid isn't really effective against quite a few pests. So for example, uh, Colorado potato beetle, you can dry in a minute and it doesn't kill them. Um, in Europe, not so much yet, um, but it's bound to come, you know. I mean, in, in, insects become resistant to everything we've ever managed to produce. And I'm sure it won't be long before we have plenty of neonic resistant insects here, particularly if we use them all the time and the insects are exposed to them all year round, which they will be because they're so persistent. Of, of course, supporting as many people as there are in the world and on a crowded island like this is gonna have big impacts on the natural environment. Uh, and that is absolutely right. You know, we, we are taking a big chunk of all the, the energy that comes from the sun and turning it into crops and eating it. Um, but we could, I think, massively reduce our impact by doing things differently, um, you know, which is basically what I was talking, talking about towards the end there. The, the evidence that we have to farm like this, and that's the only way we can feed ourselves, is actually nonsense. Um, so, Yes, we're going to do harm, but we could, we, could, we could greatly reduce the amount of harm we do if we changed our practices. And I, and I think, essentially, the way we currently farm, it only really benefits agrochemical companies and big, those big, agrochemical, uh, big corporations, the big, big industry farm. It doesn't benefit small farmers at all, the current system. And it doesn't benefit consumers because... Well, one thing I meant to say, actually, when I was showing that list of pesticides, if you were growing vegetables in your garden, would you put 20 different pesticides on them and then feed them to your kids? Would anyone here do that? Perhaps one or two of you would. I, I must admit I wouldn't. And yet, if you go to the supermarket and buy food, well, that's the same thing. That's what you're doing. Um, actually, for most fruit and veg get a lot more than 20. Um, so I've, I've slightly sidetracked from, from your question, but... Uh, I really think we should question the, the sort of paradigm that, that uh, this kind of model of intensive farming is essential. I think the current subsidy system is set up to favour really big farmers and the agglomeration of farms, which is the exact opposite of what, what it should be doing. Um, and it would be really nice to see more financial support targeted at, at small scale sort of labour-intensive but, but not pesticide-intensive farming operations. Uh, but at present, that isn't the way it works. You know, as, as I say, it's all going to Tate & Lyle, bless them, or whoever. I mean, it's a very, very long list of huge companies that are, that are getting literally millions every year. And if that money were re redirected to support small-scale, more sustainable farming, then how cool would that be?